Hi everyone. Hope you're all well, safe, and healthy. Welcome to our Pirkei Abod program. Uh, in today's lesson, we're going to read from the fifth Perek, Perek Hamishi, Mishnah Yot Vav and Zayin, numbers six and seven. Mishnah Vav is one of my favorite, I think one of the most fascinating Mishnah Yot in all of Pirkei Avot. It speaks of Asara Devarim Nebreu Be'erev Shabbat Ben Hashem Ashot. Ten items, ten creations, so to speak, were created by Hashem on Erev Shabbat Ben Hashem Ashot. Now, Erev Shabbat means before Shabbat, the um, hours or the time leading up to prior to Shabbat. Ben Hashem Ashot is actually a halachic term. It specifically refers to in halacha, the time period between sunset and nightfall. It's sort of a gray area of halakha where we're not sure it's considered day or night. And here, possibly metaphorically, they're using this time slot as a slot that was connected to the creation of the world of the universe by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Eid of Shabbat is referring to after the six days of creation and towards the onset of the seventh day, the day of rest. And this Ben Hashem Ashur is referring to a gray area of creation, so to speak. Very mysterious. There are two different tracks that we can take, and we'll take both of them simultaneously. One is that of the Rambam and Rabbi Yana, that the items that we're about to list are all speaking of the supernatural. In other words, uh, there are events and things throughout history that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, some of them you can say are Nisim Neflaot, wonders and miracles that God did, or just very unique um, realities in God's world that um, gave, were given a special time zone for their creation. But Abam says, for instance, you know, everything supernatural has its, nat its natural base in the created universe. Kohelet says, in Hadasha, God created the world once, and no, nothing has to be recreated or invented after that time. But all supernatural events, they're were embedded the potential for the supernatural and the natural. Like the seventh, second day of creation, God sort of separated the earth and the, or the land and the sea. So there, the potential of the splitting of the sea was sort of speak implanted in God's natural creation to be able to do the supernatural many years later, etc. However, there are a list of 10 unique events or realities or items that there was a special time uh, slot that was designated by HaKadosh Baruch Hu after the first six days of creation going into the seventh day called Ben Hashem Ashur. The other track is the Me'iris and that is um, a contemporary, a little after the Rambam in Spain, and that is that um, there are certain concepts or principles upon which the creation of the world is founded. In other words, you have the physical creation of the world, and then, then there's the conceptual creation of the world. Let's go th through these 10. There's another four editions afterwards. All of them have their source in Humash for the most, po for the most part, and you can track the actual uh, sources, the specific Pisukim in the Humash. First one is Pihaadis. Pihaadis is literally the mouth of the land, referring to in Parashat Korah, when the earth swallowed up in this incredible earthquake, the supernatural earthquake swallowed up literally Korah and his entourage who were rebellious against, rebellious against Moshe and Aharon, and by extension, God. And they were punished. Of course, there's something supernatural in that. There's also a representation, a conceptual representation, in that swallowing of the evil. Of course, uh, service level is punishment, it's so referring to more blatant punishment, where God blatantly punishments the evil, punishes the evil for, in, to the eyes of all. Um, it also possibly has in it the concept of Teshuvah repentance, because you know the sons of Korah did not die, because according to, to tradition, before their death, impending swallowing of the land, they, they repented and they were, they were, the lives were spared. Uh, the next one, number two, is Piha Be'er, the mouth of the well. This refers to the traditional well that we're told existed. It's, it's actually cited in a few different places in the Hamash. Existed during the 40 years of the desert on the Zechut, the merit of Miriam. 
and that quenched the thirst that fed, gave water to the nation miraculously for those 40 years. There's actually a, a, a episode in Parashat Chukad after the, one of the victories against the Jewish people's enemies, victories of war, that they sang a song, is one of the songs listed in Tanakh, and it says there, Anu Be'er Anila, which is, I'm sorry, Ali Be'er Anila, which is rise well and sing along. And the mouth of the wells is uh, alluding to the singing of that well, so to speak. Well, certainly that's miraculous, but the well itself represents sustenance. And you can say not just the sustenance of God to mankind, but the, uh, its prosperity and perhaps the surreal in, these, in the unnatural way where sometimes in history God shows mankind that he is the one that um, supports and provides the prosperity to man, for mankind to survive by showing you in the most miraculous and exaggerated ways. That's one of the representations of the Piha Be'er. Um, and you'll see something similar with the man coming up. Number three, Piha Aton, the mouth of the donkey. We know in Parashat Balak that um, uh, when Bil'am was on the way towards uh, Balak, summoned by him, commissioned that he's going to pay him to curse the Jewish people, that along the way the donkey kept collapsing until finally Bil'am started to beat it, until finally um, it got opened its mouth and it started to speak to Bil'am. That is obviously supernatural. Potential for that created in Ben Hashem Ashot, in twilight of the seventh day, so to speak, but also represents uh, Piha Anton is a, is a very curious story. Among other things, possibly represents God's intervention, but God's inconspicuous intervention. No one saw the story. No one knew about it. And yet, this intervention was one of the sources of salvation, uh, planted the seed of salvation for Am Yisrael. And uh, this is the type of intervention of God that's inconspicuous. Um, as Sira Shirim says, God peeks through the cracks of the wall uh, when we're in exile, and that's the way he saves us often. That's a concept created in twilight after the sixth day. Hakesh, uh, number four, the rainbow. The rainbow is the actual natural phenomenon that in, in occurs after some certain rainfalls. You see it in the sky, it's nice and colorful. First sighted in Parashat Noah, of course. And although it's not supernatural, it's a wonder of nature, you can say. It does not happen very often. And also, you can say conceptually that it represents this idea that man actually um, creates covenants and treaties and agreements and understandings with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, with God. It's an incredible concept that man and God actually have agreements between them. It started with Noah, and we see that throughout the history of the Jewish people. Number five, ha uh, Haman. Haman, of course, is the, the man, the manna that fell miraculously from the sky during the 40 years of the desert and supported the Jewish people. And uh, besides the miraculous nature to it, of course, conceptually, it represents, again, God's sustenance of mankind, but also sometimes the way that um, God sustains man in, uh, in a manner of perfect timing. And, and sometimes God sustains man in, in a way that um, is beyond his control and sort of seems like potluck, but it's really a Kadosh Baruch Hu behind the scenes. And also represents the fact that God is consistently giving to man, even though man doesn't always realize. Um, Hamate, this is number six. Hamate refers to the staff of Moshe Rabbeinu, which had inscribed on it according to tradition the uh, actual explicit name of God, which we are not aware of exactly what it is in our days. And of course, with that staff, that Moshe Rabbeinu performed all the supernatural miracles in Misraim after the exodus from Egypt. And this staff might represent the concept that man can act as a conduit uh, be, uh, uh, for, for God to perform his miracles and supernatural wonders in this world. He summons and commissions prophets, for instance, and here this staff was actually the physical conduit through which some of the miracles were performed. The Hash Hashamir, this is interesting. This is not a pasuk anywhere in Hamash. It alludes to something in Malachim Aleph when Shulamah Amalek was building the first temple, the Beit HaMikdash, and um, of course he quarried the stone from the mountains, an incredible amount of huge boulders, really uh, hard to even be for these days for people to explain how they were transported and brought and, and, and uh, used to found the stones of the walls. But uh, Shulamah Melech 
and in quarrying those stones and chiseling them, of course, he was not allowed to use instruments. So we're told traditionally that this shamid is a worm. And this worm is something that is, um, I can't tell you exactly what species it is, but when placed upon stone, has the ability to crack it. And that was his secret weapon, so to speak, and representing the fact that in God has leveraged nature incredibly, and he has his secret weapons in nature, and has embedded in, in, in the most inconspicuous creatures of nature, some uh, incredible um, talents, so to speak, and, um, and, and different potential and possibility that man could use it for. The last three refer to the Luchot, HaKetav HaMechtav HaLuchot, the writing on the two tablets that Moshe Rabbeinu brought down, which is the Torah, HaMechtav, the way it was written, and the Luchot, the tablet itself. Well, HaKetav refers to the Torah, our Torah. What's so um, supernatural about our Torah? Well, conceptually, here's where the supernatural and the, and the conceptual clash. The Torah is the um, insatiable ocean of knowledge. It's the bottomless pit. It's the mysterious. It's the deep. It's the intellect of God. At the same time, it's the Kitab. It's a text that man himself, even the simplest of men, can read and gain from. That's miraculous, and that's, that's a very deep concept. The mikhtav and the luchot, the writing and the tablets themselves were, uh, we are told, supernaturally built, and where there were, there were letters that are carved through one end to, to the other of the tablets, and some of the middle of the letters were suspended in air. Tablets, the words were read the same from both sides, even though it was backwards on one side. And of course, that just adds to the mystery and the uh, enigmatic nature of our depth of our Torah, of course. Yeshomim, some say, Afamazikin, even these supernatural, um, you can say, metaphysical beings, the detrimental, damaging beings that, that exist in God's metaphysical world, that we pray for protection against them sometimes, representing possibly the interface between the natural and the supernatural. Ukbura Toshel Moshe, the burial of Moshe, amazingly, all these this, centuries and millennia, man has never been able to discover, to discover the Torah testified where the burial place of Moshe Rabbeinu is, and of course representing possibly the mystery of death itself. And also some say, Elosh Abraham Avinu, the isle, the ram, which Abraham Avinu found and replaced with the, uh, instead of offering Yishak as a, as, a, as a sacrifice in Akedat Yishak, he replaced it with that, with that ram, and possibly representing the fact that man does what he can, even though what you thought was going to happen doesn't always uh, play out what you imagined, you replace it with the best that you can. The Yeshua name is a final, some say at the end of this Mishnah, af sebat v'sebiat al suya. The tongue or the mold is made with another tongue or mold, referring to the fact that when a blacksmith makes a mold of metal, he has to hold it with the tongue when it comes out very hot. But where'd that tongue come from? Any mold has to have another mold that makes it. Any, any um, melted, uh, molten, uh, uh, metallic substance has to have something that it first came from. So who made the first mold? The answer is God. Um, let's go on to the next Mishnah, Zayin. Shiv'a levarim b'cholem, shiv'a b'chacham. There are seven um, traits you can speak of about a hacham and a golem. Golem literally means a raw material like a piece of wood that's not yet carved. It's referring to the person that has, um, has some knowledge and um, some, po some positive traits. He's just not perfectly refined because he doesn't have a, um, a large scope and, and depth of chokmah, of, of knowledge, of Torah knowledge. Um, but it is a, a person that is, you know, a fine standing person in society. He just doesn't have the refinement to give him the same type of traits that the hacham can have, the wise man. So here, we'll just take the positive, the traits of the wise man. We'll name seven of them, as the Mishnah does. Hacham, a real hacham never speaks in front of or before someone who is greater than him in, than him in wisdom and in stature. Because um, why should I speak? Obviously, not just a matter of respect speaking before him, that would be ludicrous. But if someone has greater chokhmah than me, why should I put my own wisdom on display? Let me instead gain, if I really uh, uh, quest wisdom and knowledge, let me just hear from someone who has much more to give than I have. 
Ve'enu nechnas v'toch d'bnei havero. Never interrupts, intercedes um, in the middle of a, another person's speaking. Not just because it's rude and impolite, but also because if you really are, a true hacham is not just concerned about listening to himself and what he's going to respond, but really wants to be able to gain from the person who's speaking to him. Maybe I have much more to gain than I have to give. If I interrupt someone, it's showing that I don't really quest knowledge. If I'm patient and I listen, so that means that I, I uh, am open to whatever the person on the other side is saying, and I might gain a lot because I quest for knowledge in every form. Never is hasty, never is impulsive to give an answer. He thinks first, he deliberates, he's patient, he internalizes before he quickly and hastily gives an answer and gives the answer with wisdom, with chokhmah. He always asks on point, spot on, something that is right on topic, something that elicits the, elicits the response of the person that he's asking. And Meshiv, when, when he has to answer, it's always kahalacha, it's accurate, it's succinct, and it's proper. He says on what's first, first, and what's last, last. It doesn't just mean that if someone asks you consecutive questions and you, you respond to the first one first. It really means when you respond, you always give a presentation where some things have to precede the specific answer, introduction, background. And therefore, you start with the more vague, the more broad, and you move slowly into the specific answer that you're trying to get to. That's the order of your presentation as a hacham. Um, the last two, Ba'al Mashi Lo Shama Omer Lo Shamati, and something that he never heard before, he'll admit, I never heard it. This is not just humility where you're admitting that I don't know an answer. It's also sometimes you have to um, admit the fact that this is not something that I read or I quoted from somewhere. It's, it's a haram to quote someone inaccurately and that I have never seen this before. And if I want to offer an answer, let me just tell you, this is what I reason and I believe and this is my own thing, disclaimer, but might not be accurate. And finally, always acknowledges the truth. A person who seeks knowledge, wisdom, who embodies knowledge and wisdom, but always seeks it, will always acknowledge when something is true, when someone else is correct. He will never keep arguing and keep contending with something just because he can and he's talented. He'll be honest enough to admit the fact that I'm wrong because I seek the truth. The hacham really seeks the truth, wants knowledge in every form, and um, humbles himself when necessary to attain that knowledge. And the opposite of all these is with the golem, with the unrefined person. So let's seek to be hachamim, to have great knowledge, and to be wise, and to practice in all the ways suggested by this Mishnah Pekah Have a wonderful day and evening, and stay safe and healthy.